words. The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Stephen Hunter. Let the ancient words Friday night, <clears throat> I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for supper. That's just what I wanted. And uh, Saturday, <clears throat> for lunch, I had white beans and cornbread with onion and ham and just the right amount of Louisiana hot sauce to really give it some flavor. Now, when I was a kid, these were meals that I despised because they were so frequently served at my mama's table. Uh, in addition to those, you had uh, my daddy always loved cabbage with uh, cooked cabbage with that, that uh, Polish sausage in it. And man, that would smell up the entire house in the most unpleasant way. But I had those meals yesterday and Friday night, and I was thinking how when I was a kid, and you know, if uh, mom and dad coming home from work, and they say, you know, first, first question a kid always has is, what's for supper? And, you know, you'd wait to hear, and, and anytime it had macaroni and cheese in it, that was a good thing. You look forward to that as a kid. But if mama said, well, you can have uh, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or you can have leftover, right? Left, there's always something left over because you don't throw it out. Sometimes it tastes better the second day around when it's had time to kind of sit and marinate or, or fester, whichever word you prefer. And, and so you, you would have these meals and you just go, oh, I don't want that. Well, what do you want? I want McDonald's or I want a steak or I want a potato. She's, that sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, can we have that? She said, you can have peanut butter, jelly sandwich or some of the leftover, you know. And, and so a lot of times the things that, What's funny is, I said, as a kid, I hated this stuff, but now as an adult, I'm like, oh, man, that sounds pretty good. We used to go deer hunt, uh, excuse me, deer hunting, duck hunting all the time, and in the duck blind, my Uncle Bo always brought Spam, and he would fry Spam and bologna, and we'd have fried Spam and bologna sandwiches, uh, because in the back of the duck blind, you could, you know, you could do that, and it was a, we hunted as much as we ate, I, I promise you. But you'd have that, but something that always grossed me out. My Uncle Bo would have this can of Vienna sausages. You know what I'm talking about, right? Now, he would strip that lid, and I'd watch him do this. Some of you are about to go, uh -huh, watch. I guarantee it. He would get one of those little Vienna sausages out, had that nasty old jelly stuff, and, he, and I'd go, uh -huh. You know, that was my thing. That was, now, I could eat it. But that nasty jelly stuff that was on, I didn't want anything to do with that. That just looked like it was growing into some primordial creature. But what I want to try and do is, is not be such a complainer. I can always find something to complain about, can't you? There's always something displeasing. There's always something, and someone gives their best effort, and you look at, what do you think? I was like, well, it's crooked, or this, that, and the other. And um, I, I want to be the kind of person who always has a grateful heart in all circumstances, even the most unfortunate circumstances. That, that's hard to do when it comes to that. There are times when it's easy to be grateful. Uh, there are times when it's easy to give thanks to God. But what about in the hard situations where it's not so easy or where the outcome is not so hard or, or not so favorable? Well... Last Sunday, we had finished from Luke 17, not that we're going chapter by chapter in the Gospel of Luke, it just so happens as I read, I'm going, well, let's just go here next week. But last week, uh, we, we focused on the apostles requesting an increase in their faith, but this week, Jesus has left that scene, and in Luke 17, he's headed to Jerusalem, and he's passing through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now, these are two places, obviously, where you would have encountered not only Jews, but also uh, Samaritans. And because of this, he finds a mixed audience that normally wouldn't have been mixed. The Jews and the Samaritans typically had no dealings with one of the other because they, they had an animosity between those two races. But 
lepers were outcast. And so you had Samaritan lepers, you had Jewish lepers, and they were able to put aside their racial differences because they were united in their suffering. And so they came together on the basis of their leprosy. And so as he enters this certain village, ten men who were lepers, they stood afar off. Now why is this? Because what we see is the plight of the leper according to Scripture. All the way back in Leviticus, we see that the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, his head shall be bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. He shall be unclean. All the days that he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So any person that had leprosy, as it was defined and acknowledged by the priests of the temple, they were to go outside of the, of the borders of whatever town that they found themselves in. This is why you have Jewish and Samaritan lepers with each other. They got over their racial differences because they were outcasts. And sometimes outcasts get together. And here they are. And they don't go near Jesus because that's contrary to law. So they stand afar off and they cry out to Jesus. Lifting their voices, the Scriptures say, Master, have mercy on us. Leprosy... Uh, was rather a very uncomfortable thing to experience. Uh, there are still few leper colonies around the world. Uh, not very many of them exist. But depending on what the form of leprosy was, it could be very painful. It could be irritating. Sometimes it could be on the outside of the body in various places that are most uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes it could be inward. It could be in the throat and in the mouth. And because of its unknown origin, often at times, the lepers were to keep away from everybody else. And they were to have marked themselves uh, according to this, covering their mustache, uh, leaving their head bare, tearing their clothes. And it was easy to spot them. Though if you saw one, you likely would want to keep a distance. Now, as those of us who were well and not lepers, we can understand, were we to see one, uh, hesitating to, to, to want to go near these people. But imagine if you were the actual leper where you had to keep away from others. And then imagine if, as others saw you, they purposefully might have kept an eye on you. I've got to make sure that leper doesn't get too close. You've got to stay just so far away. You, you, you can imagine... The, the feeling they might have had having the affliction that they had. And the only thing that they wanted was mercy from Christ. They'd likely heard about Jesus in this region, His preaching, uh, His miracle working. They had heard the report of Him. Maybe one of the other lepers that He had healed along in His journey had come back and in proximity said, hey, you need to find Jesus because Jesus is the one who can heal you of this. And so maybe they had stood off at a distance when he was teaching and seen who he was, and now they have a chance encounter with him. And in this chance encounter, they cry out, lifting their voices, have mercy on us. And so as he sees them, he simply says to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And so they're thinking, this is what the law says. Thus, the pre you can read all of Leviticus 13 and 14 and you'll see everything that the law says pertaining to lepers. And go so, show yourselves to the priest. Well, they knew according to law that if you go show yourselves to the priest, it was for the purpose of healing. So they're going, okay, at some point we're going to be healed and the priest will declare us healed and then we can make the appropriate sacrifices and be admitted back into the camp and not be these outsiders. We can go back around our families, go back around our friends. And it so happened that as it was, that as they went, they were cleansed. So they start to obey, and as they're obeying, the healing comes. And they're noticing this. 
But one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he returned and with a loud voice glorified God. We don't glorify God with loud voices so much, do we? we just, Thank you, Lord. Could you imagine the excitement on this guy's face? Could you imagine how he's shouting from the rooftops, if you will? He's glorifying God. Thank you, God! Thank you! And he's running back to Jesus, and he falls down. I'm sure I might have woken up a couple people with that. He fell down on his face, and at his feet he gives thanks to Jesus. And Luke adds this footnote. He was a Samaritan. He was a Samaritan. Here's what's very fascinating about this as they're bound for the temple. Uh, the priests would have held Moses as superior to Jesus. But there's a story all the way back in the book of Numbers when Moses' sister Miriam is inflicted with leprosy by the Lord, and it was because she opposed her brother and his leadership. And so God punished her with leprosy, and she goes to her brother, and she's essentially saying, I'm in agony, pray for me. And so Moses does. He can't go, Miriam, be healed. And it happens. He doesn't have that ability. And so he prays to the Lord. But it doesn't come immediately. It comes, I believe, after seven days. And so when leprosy came to the feet of Moses, this is what he was able to do. And it took several days, and then the healing came. But Jesus instantaneously came just like that. And so when they went to show themselves to the priests. Priests likely would have inquired and they would have said, how did this come to be? Jesus. Jesus. But what I find also, also interesting, Christ says, were there not ten? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? There was an inscription just outside the temple that uh, uses this same exact... There are several words that you could uh, give that would be translated as foreigner, but there's a specific one that Luke uses here. And it's the same word that was found on a temple inscription according to the historian Josephus who lived around this time. He said there was a stone wall for a partition with an inscription which forbade any foreigner to go in under pain of death. So the Jews had made this inscription and they posted it outside the temple compound and they said, no foreigner shall come beyond this point lest they die. And so this very one who returned to Jesus to give God glory, to fall at the feet of Jesus, was the very one who the religious elite said, you can't come in because God will strike you dead or <laughs> perhaps maybe even we will. So you can't go beyond this point to approach the God of Israel to, to give, off, uh, to give uh, sacrifices and offerings and praise and thanksgiving, but you didn't need the temple. Why? Because you had God in the flesh right there. So it's a nice little play on things that happened here. Uh, this play on words that, that the Jews were familiar with and, and, and that the audience of Luke were familiar with. And so Jesus simply says, Arise. And go your way, your faith has made you well. I think it's easy for us to be thankful when good things happen, isn't it? To glorify God and to give thanks when something like this has been afflicting a person and then we seek the Lord for His blessings of healing and, and restoration of health and He gives it and it comes. That's easy to be thankful, but what about when the healing doesn't come? What about when we don't get what we ask for? Maybe it has nothing to do with illness. Maybe it just has to do with a situation or circumstance in life. Can we still be thankful then? You notice there are people who sometimes have a default mindset that in any circumstance they, they say, well, I'm thankful that this wasn't the outcome. You know, you go to them, you go, I'm real sorry for what's happened. I'm real sorry for what you're going through. I'm real sorry for that. And they go, yeah, it's, it's, it's not what I wanted, but I'm thankful that it wasn't this. Like when a person's house burns down 
and they lost everything that maybe they worked a lifetime to build, to accumulate, and you go, I'm so sorry to have heard that your house burned down. Yeah, that's all right, though. I've got insurance. It'll all be built back. I'm just glad that nobody lost their life. And you go, well, that's a really good perspective to have, isn't it? But sometimes situations get harder and harder to find a heart of thanksgiving. Sometimes circumstances are so rough that how can I have a grateful heart? And in the Scriptures, there are a few reasons why we above all as Christians should be people with grateful hearts. And what I want to challenge you to do is to find it within yourself, no matter the circumstance, to find gratitude. I don't want to eat that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I don't want to eat that bowl of white beans and cornbread. But my mama would always say, you need to be thankful that you've even got something to eat. Okay. So let's look at a few of these reasons. If you have your Bibles, please feel free to follow along with me. Um, first of all, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, we see that being thankful is a stark contrast to living in the sinful world. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Paul says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, that is telling inappropriate jokes, I suppose, which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. So rather than having all these sinful inclinations and way of life, we live lives of thanksgiving to contrast that. Man, I'm thankful for the rain. Most people complain, well, we've, we've, we've not had any rain. And you know what I found interesting about this is, you know, some of the farmers that I've talked to here at Glendale Road, they said, I have had my best corn crop ever that I can ever remember. I think Grundy, you, you hinted something at that. Steve Carraway has, has said something about it. said they've had their best corn crop that they can remember. Well, we didn't have a lot of rain, but you know what? We can be thankful that the farmers have had their best corn crop. It's been awful dry, hasn't it? You know, and, and, and so, so, you know, it's easy to go, boy, we sure need to rain. This is suffering, that is suffering. And, and I, you know, there's, there's plenty of complaint to be found. But can we find a reason to be thankful? Because sometimes when we're ungrateful, what are we ungrateful about if it's not the very thing that God provides us with? And you look and you go, we had a drought. It's been very dry. And that's a lot to complain about because, you know, the, the soybeans, the tobacco, the various other uh, crops, the, if, you, if you have livestock, that's not the greatest thing. Uh, all these other things. But in the midst of it, has any good been seen in your lives or my life? And so maybe that's a, an easy example. It's the first one that springs to mind. But if I complain about it, well, God, you gave me a good corn crop. But what am I doing? I'm complaining about the drought. They're probably more personal examples to give, but I don't want to create any, any hard feelings on a person that's already going through a difficult time. But in the misery of life or in the uncomfortableness of life, where can you find gratefulness? Where can you find gratitude? Because it will be shown as a contrast to sin. God, I thank you for the time that I've had. I thank you for this. I thank you for that. Um, I, I was thinking about just, I was like, okay, now, Stephen, look over your life and what can you find? Okay, difficult circumstances. When I was an infant, I have no memory of this. I've only learned about it as an adult uh, by the recounting of the tales from my mother. But she was married to my father, obviously, my biological father. And he, he liked to, to sip from the bottle, and he liked to smoke the peace pipe, as we say, on the reservation. 
He, he loved the marijuana. He loved the alcohol. And he also liked hitting my mother. But she took me and she got out. You know what? You may not realize this, but I think it takes a tremendous amount of courage for a woman in an abusive relationship to leave. Because many of them stay sometimes to their own peril. Well, he apologized. They want to believe the best. Some of them stay and they keep getting beaten. Some of them even wind up dead. So I'm thankful that she left. I think that took a lot of courage. And then I'm thankful that as I was about eight or nine years old, she met my stepfather, the man who would become my stepfather, married him. And I'm grateful that he and his family raised me. They're the reasons I'm even a Christian today, I think. And so when you hear me talk about Daddy and Uncle Bo and Granddaddy and a lot of them, that's that family. But all that started out with substance abuse and domestic violence. Two horrible things. But there's good to come out of it. And then you go forward in life and you keep recounting the, the various times when things were bad but God showed up with His good. Uh, I, I credit... God with the goodness of my wife, who's probably helped me become a lot better version of myself than what I would have ever been without her. She and God have worked very hard. And if you're going, well, gosh, there's still a lot left to be done. I, I, I agree with you. All I can say is be thankful that you don't know the me that used to be. Because Stephanie and God have, have really worked together to, to cure me of that fella. And, and, and so you can go forward, and, and in Ephesians 5, verses 18 through 20, we often use this verse, or hear this verse used, as an argument against instruments in the worship of God, but uh, when, when you see the words, there's, there's even a greater meaning than what we often ascribe to it. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So we can demonstrate a sign of being full of the Spirit by being thankful people, being grateful, especially in the difficult circumstances. And another passage used similarly in the same way, uh, Colossians 3 Verses 15 and 16. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So when we have attitudes of thankfulness, we contrast our lives as being opposite to that of sin. We also show that we are full of the Spirit. Uh, we show that the peace and the Word of God rule in our lives. Because we can find reasons to be thankful. Right? And some of the recent passings that we've had in our church family and those that we love, um, there have been a lot of suffering and un, un, unhappiness and mourning. But there are some that you go, uh, well, we know where they are. They, many of whom, Christians obviously, are in far greater, a far greater place than what we now occupy. A place full of thanksgiving where no complaints exist because everything is as it should be. Doesn't that make you want to go there? It, it does me. I, sometimes I just... I, I've started more and more, and I didn't used to do this, but I've started more and more praying that prayer, Lord, come quickly. For myself, I'm, I would be content to go. Uh, I would be happy. Uh, 
appreciate you all, love you, but I, 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 let's, I'm ready to go home. You know, you ever get to that party or that gathering and then um, you, you're ready to go and you just go, honey, let's go home. I, I, I've had enough of this party, if you will. I'm ready to go. You know, too much nastiness in this world. I want to go be with my Father. I want to go be with my Savior. And maybe some of you aren't in as big a rush. That's okay. That's fine. But I would be content, and I hope that uh, if it were my time, that the Lord would welcome me into His presence. Because this world is overrated. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 Paul begins this by saying, be anxious for nothing. Now, I read this and I go, I'm one of those people that has anxiety diagnosed as such by a a, a doctor. And I, I have this nice, I call it my happy pill. I take my happy pill every morning. That keeps me somewhat sane. But if anyone's ever had an anxiety attack, that is one of the most helpless and horrible experiences that you can have. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so, with having this this mindset of thanksgiving and with having uh, this focus In the midst of our anxiety, uh, one of the things we can do is obviously always offer up prayer to God and trust that His peace will guide us and guard us in those days. This is a demonstration of our trust in God. Now, it's not easy to not be anxious, especially when there are obviously things that that exist in our lives to be anxious about. Um, I mentioned a little bit ago having an anxiety attack. I've had a few of those, and I'll tell you what, I cannot get out of here fast enough whenever they come on. Because you, you, you know, maybe that's, I think maybe that's what the old southern women meant when they said, I'm about to have a come apart. <laughs> that's kind of what, y'all heard that phrase before? Oh, I'm about to have a come apart. And I, I was like, I never knew what that meant, but when I've had one of those anxiety attacks, I, something's about to come apart, that's all I know. I mean, it's, and I was talking to my doctor about it. I was like, what is that? She said, you know that fight or flight uh, response to, 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 to stress? And I said, yeah. She said, that's exactly what it is. It's the, the fight or flight mechanism just really kicking in. Because uh, yeah, what happens for me, I get this rush of adrenaline. I start breathing deeper. I get the shakes. Oh, boy. I need to. I feel like I could. I could outrun Usain Bolt. Isn't that that guy's name, the fastest runner on the earth? Either that, or I'd chase him and tackle him, or something. I don't know. But it's it's one of the worst feelings I've ever experienced in my life. And so Paul says, "Be anxious for nothing." And so, well, how do I do this? Well, you you pray with supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Let him know what it is. And, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guards your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, have you ever seen some of these people going through some rough times and they seem to be doing a lot better than what is normal? You kind of wonder, have they really grasped what is happening? Some people have a peace about them that others don't. Uh, Esther Cahoon, who has been in hospice a while, we've, I've had a chance to visit her, and, and um, I was actually pulling out one morning, and Stephanie called me, and I was right about to pull it, and I just dropped her off. So I answered as any loving husband would, what? Right? <laughs> I just left you. And she said, I had my dog, I had our dog Winston with us. She said, hey, will you come back and bring Winston in? Miss Esther wants to see Winston. And so I turned back around and I, he's a little miniature schnauzer, ankle biter we call them, a yip yapper. And so I got Winston on his leash and, and I took him back in and we, she was in a seat and, and you know, he was, he was very excitable. 
And so we put Winston in her lap, and she just rubbed on him. And, and he was, of course, me and Mom were there, so he wanted us more than her. And Miss Esther said, oh, he don't want me. <laughs> so, but that wasn't it. We were just there. But she is quite ready to go be with the Lord. Uh, some of the stories that, that, I, <laughs> that I have heard from her relatives and from the nurses, they're quite humorous. And if you know Miss Esther, they are. Uh, she was trying to talk one of the nurses into just ending it for her. <laughs> and she said, now, Miss Esther, aren't you a Christian? And Esther said, well, John Dell says I am. <laughs> and so she said, now, what's that commandment that the Lord wrote? And she said, you mean that one about not killing? She said, yeah. She said, okay. And so she got mad because she was trying to talk her into ending it for her. And, and then on this one occasion, I guess it was one of her grandsons or her nephew was was holding her hand and, and he sat long enough and he got a bit stiff so he let go of her hand to, to kind of twist and stretch out a bit and, and, and she went, quit all that moving. I can't go be with the Lord if you're moving. He won't come and get me. And so apparently he was making way too much noise for the Lord to come. And then on another occasion, the one nurse who told me the story about you know, Miss Esther trying to talk her into to ending it all, she said that uh, she was trying to kick her out. She said, get her out of here. The Lord's not going to come get me as long as she's right here. And she, it, there's just so much. She's ready to go. And, you know, you think, well, she's, she's in her 90s. She's lived a, a good, long life. Nobody can blame her. But why can't be, we be ready right now? This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart.